Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and I'm not half giant, I'm just big boned. And my co-host, Ellen, isn't half house elf, she's just little boned. I'm not that short, though. That's, that's not the point. Fair enough. Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 23, the Yule Ball and the corresponding film scenes. Parvati and Padma decided to take back their night by ditching their deadbeat dates. Ron won the crown for Yule Ball King of Undeniable Jealousy. The band that needed no introduction ended up being spectacularly wired. If the carriages are a rockin', Harry shouldn't go a knockin'. Snape spends his magical evening cock-blocking all of the hot and bothered carriage rockers. Hermione's magical evening is ruined by hormones, not for the first time and certainly not the last. And we all highly doubt Madame Maxime is big-boned, but Hagrid was ready to give her one. (laughs) That's dirty. During episode 92, Can't Even Read, our Potter pondering was... How do you feel about the way the movie handled the conversation between Hagrid and Madame Maxime about being half-giant from this chapter of the book? And we had a wonderful discussion about this on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. But we picked some of our best voicemails to include in this episode. We did. All right, Support Badger here. I am calling to respond to this week's Potter Pondering. So... Um, I really don't like that they leave out Hagrid's backstory in this movie, obviously. Um, But I do like that they leave out the fact that Madame Maxime decides to be a giant twat to Hagrid. No point. He's the best. So those are my only thoughts, for real. Hi, it's Max. And I'll just say that whatever Hagrid's meant to have said in the movie... Can't be that bad, considering he's confident enough to go for a cheeky ass grab only a few minutes later. You know, it's funny because the movie just kind of glossed over what was supposed to be an emotional moment for Hagrid. And I don't think that's fair that he doesn't get that moment because he doesn't get that many moments where we learn about his background anyways. So why take one moment that he has and make a fucking mockery of it? Like, why take this from him? I'm confused. I'm baffled, befuddled, irate, irritated, agitated, and a little disheartened. Like, I don't get it. Like, it just seems like they just want to, what's the word I'm looking for? Mess with my fucking childhood. That's what it seems like they want to do. It seems like they want to just, like, perfectly mess with me. Somebody sat down in that writing room and was like, you know what? Let's go ahead and mess with Quincy right now. Let's take this from the movie or let's add this to the movie. They always want to add things that have nothing to do with the movie. They want to take things out that don't need to be taken out. And then they want to cut the movie in half. Like, I don't get it. I'm a little upset. Plus, I stubbed my toe today. So, you know, there's that. Our trivia question last week was, what does Ron joke should be the name of Hermione's goblin cause? We wanted both the name and the acronym. When Hermione comments on how funny it is that the goblins talking to Ludo Bagman were supposedly looking for Barty Crouch, Ron asks her if she's now worrying about poor Ickle Goblins and thinking of starting up Spug, or the Society for the Protection of Ugly Goblins. And congratulations goes to Sammy Adams! Woohoo! Nice job, Sammy! She is starting up a streak. Mm -hmm. This is her second week in a row. Nine more to go to tie! We'll see if she can keep it up, but for now, let's just keep rolling into the first half of Chapter 24, Rita Skeeter's Scoop, and the film scenes that somewhat corresponded with an earlier section, but not really here, though organizationally we didn't know where else to put them. Yeah. Chapter 24, Rita Skeeter's Scoop, Part 1. Everyone sleeps in on Boxing Day, leaving the Gryffindor common room much quieter than it had been lately. 
Hermione's hair is once again bushy, and she confesses that she had used liberal amounts of Sleek Easy's hair potion, but it's way too much work for every day. She and Ron seem to be getting along again, though are oddly formal with one another. The boys waste no time in telling Hermione what they overheard between Madame Maxime, though she isn't really shocked to learn that Hagrid is half-giant, figuring he must have been and saying that she knew he couldn't have been pure blood since giants are about 20 feet tall. She also says that she thinks the hysteria about giants is similar to the prejudice about werewolves, because they can't all be horrible. Likely hoping to avoid another fight, Ron doesn't say anything, but he does shake his head disbelievingly when she isn't looking. Now everyone has to start thinking about the homework they neglected, and Harry also has to start trying to solve the egg, since February 24th looks a lot closer now that Christmas is over. He tries shaking it, asking it questions, and even throws it across the room, but nothing helps him figure it out. He remembers the hint that Cedric gave him, but is feeling less than friendly towards him at the moment. Harry had specifically told him about the dragons, and all Cedric did in return was tell him to take a bath, and he didn't need that sort of rubbishy help, especially from someone who keeps walking down corridors hand in hand with Cho. So when the new term starts, he sets off to lessons weighed down not only with his usual school supplies, but also with the lurky worry of the egg heavy in his stomach. The snow is so thick that the greenhouse windows are covered in condensation that blocks their view out of them. No one is looking forward to care of magical creatures in the cold, but when they arrive at Hagrid's cabin, they find an old witch with gray hair and a prominent chin waiting at his front door to start class. She introduces herself as Professor Grubblyplank and says that Hagrid is indisposed when Harry and Ron both ask where he is. The Slytherins all look very gleeful at this news, and Professor Grubblyplank asks them all to follow her around the paddock where the Bobaton horses are being kept. The trio follow the temporary care of Magic Creatures teacher, but look back at the drawn curtains of Hagrid's windows, worrying that he's in there alone and ill. Harry tries to ask Grubblyplank what's wrong with Hagrid, and she tells him not to mind, then ignores him when he said he does mind, though. They reach the edge of the forest and see a large and beautiful unicorn tethered to a tree. Many girls ooh at the sight of the unicorn, which shines so bright white, it makes the snow all around it look gray. The teacher tells the boys to keep back, since unicorns prefer a woman's touch, and then encourages the girls to approach with care. Once out of earshot, Harry and Ron begin discussing what could be wrong with Hagrid, and Malfoy interrupts to hand him a news article that was folded in his pocket. Harry reads it with Ron, Dean, Seamus, and Neville looking over his shoulder. The title says, Dumbledore's Giant Mistake, and the article itself criticizes the headmaster's controversial staff appointments before continuing on to share the alarmingly large and ferocious-looking man who was expelled from Hogwarts in his third year, worked as a gamekeeper ever since, and used his mysterious influence over Dumbledore to secure the additional position of Care Against Magical Creatures teacher. Draco Malfoy is quoted talking about being attacked by a hippogriff, and mentioning his friend Vincent Crabbe getting a bad bite off a flabber worm, saying they all hate Hagrid but are too scared to say anything. Rita Skeeter brings up the blast-ended scroots, saying they are a highly dangerous cross between manticores and fire crabs that Hagrid bred himself and should be restricted. The article then reveals that Hagrid is not a pure-blood wizard or even pure-blood human, and that his mother is none other than the giantess Fredwolfa whose whereabouts are currently unknown. She goes on to talk about how bloodthirsty and brutal giants are, how some joined in with he who must not be named and were responsible for some of the worst mass muggle killings of his reign. Fridwulfa was not one of the giants killed by Aurors, but it is possible that she escaped to one of the giant communities in the foreign mountain ranges. Based on his antics during Care of Magical Creatures, Rita posits that Hagrid seems to have inherited his mother's brutal nature. The article closes on a mention of his close friendship with Harry Potter and says that Albus Dumbledore has a duty to ensure that he and his fellow students are warned about the dangers of associating with part giants.
Ron is open mouth, wondering how Rita Skeeter found out. But Harry is livid and rounds on Malfoy, asking him what he means by we all hate Hagrid and commenting on the rubbish of Crab getting bit by a flobber worm which doesn't even have teeth. Crab is sniggering, pleased with himself, and Malfoy is certain this will put an end to the oaf's teaching career. He had previously just thought that Hagrid had swallowed a bottle of Skelligro when he was young, but is sure that none of the mummies and daddies will like that he's half-giant. Harry starts to retort, but they are interrupted by Professor Grubblyplank, who calls back to them to see that they are paying attention. They look back up towards the unicorn, but Harry is so angry that he doesn't really see anything or hear any of the magical properties that Grubbly Plank is going over. As they walk back to the castle at the end of the lesson, Parvati exclaims that she hopes that woman stays, saying that was what she always thought care of magical creatures would be like. Harry wants to know what about Hagrid, and Parvati firmly responds that he can still be gamekeeper. She has been very cool towards Harry since the ball. He supposes he should have paid her more attention, but she seems to have had a good time and has been telling everyone about her plans to meet the boy from Bobatons in Hogsmeade on the next weekend trip. Hermione catches up with Harry and Ron as they enter the Great Hall and starts to mention how good the lesson was, but Harry cuts her off with the article. Like Ron, Hermione wonders how that horrible Skeeter woman found out, thinking maybe she somehow overheard him tell Madame Maxime at the ball. Ron figures they would have seen her in the garden and points out that Dumbledore banned her from the school. Harry thinks she may have an invisibility cloak, figuring she'd be the type to hide in the bushes listening to people. Hermione reminds Harry that that's what he and Ron did, and Ron indignantly defends them, saying they weren't trying to hear him. They decide to go visit him that evening and tell them that they want him back, and after dinner they head to Hagrid's cabin. They knock on his door and even a window for ten minutes, and though they can hear Fang, Hagrid never answers the door. Hermione doesn't understand why he's avoiding them, because surely he knows they don't care about him being half-giant, but it seems that Hagrid does care. They don't see him all week, at mealtimes, performing his gamekeeper duties, or in class. Malfoy gloats every opportunity that he can, deliberately choosing ones where a teacher is around so he's safe from Harry's retaliation. The movie scene starts out with an establishing shot in the bell tower, as the bell chimes and sends birds scattering. It cuts to a shot outside the castle as birds fly through the windows and the camera follows a raven as it glides through the towers and lands on the windowsill outside Harry's dormitory. The camera view shifts to inside the dormitory and pans from the bird through the window to a fitfully sleeping Harry. It shifts to his dream, which is back in the graveyard from the beginning of the film, showing a bird landing on the Statue of Death before zooming in on the stone skull face and transitioning into the hallway of the dusty mansion. Outside the room where an unseen Voldemort sits in a chair, with Wormtail and the other man hovering near him. Voldemort whispers a request to see it again, and the other man pulls up his sleeve to show a black tattoo of the same mark he cast after the Quidditch World Cup. Voldemort declares the time to be close now, and the camera cuts back to the unsettled sleeping Harry, as Voldemort's voice says, Harry, at last. Switching back to the dream, Wormtail appears in the doorway and Voldemort asks him to step aside so he can give their guest a proper greeting. Wormtail steps aside and with a flash of green light, Harry wakes up in a panic. The camera focuses on a close-up of his eyes as he blinks and then cuts to Neville, who is just arriving back at their dormitory, with dress robes a little disheveled and his shoes around his neck. He asks Harry if he is alright, and then proudly informs him that he just got in. Harry never says anything, just wipes his face as a smiling Neville twirls off to bed. The scene transitions to the covered bridge outside the castle, as Hermione's voice is heard admonishing Harry for telling her that he had that clue figured out weeks ago, and reminds him that the task is in two days. It cuts to Harry and Hermione standing on the bridge as Harry sarcastically tells her that he had no idea, and then says he supposes Victor has already figured it out. Hermione tells him that she wouldn't know, since they don't actually talk about the tournament, or anything at all really. She calls him a physical being and then gives an embarrassed smile as Harry smirks, and explains that she just means he isn't particularly loquacious, and mostly just watches her study. She calls it a bit annoying, and then changes the subject back to the egg, causing Harry's grin to fade, as she asks if he is trying to figure it out. 
He wants to know what that's supposed to mean, and Hermione gives him a dose of reality about the tournament, telling him that the tasks are designed to test him in a brutal way that's almost cruel, and she's scared for him. Harry looks grim as she reminds him that he got past the dragon mostly on nerve, and she's not sure that will be enough this time. They are interrupted by Cedric's voice calling for Potter. Harry looks towards him and immediately starts to walk in the opposite direction. Cedric jogs to catch up to him, calling after him again, and then asks him how he is. Harry turns and gives him a sarcastic, spectacular. So Cedric gets to the point, telling Harry that he realized he never properly thanked him for tipping him off about the dragons. Harry tells him to forget about it, because he's sure he would have done the same for him, and Cedric responds with, Exactly. He then tells Harry about the prefect's bathroom on the fifth floor, and says he should take his egg there for a bath to mull things over in the hot water. He then walks away, leaving behind a bewildered Harry. So, there are actually no corresponding film scenes for this chapter. Not even remotely. Like, not at all. No, it wasn't. (laughs) But we didn't really have anywhere else to include these two shorter movie scenes, so we decided the first half of chapter 24 was really the only place to fit them in. Especially since the second half of the movie section actually does relate to the end of chapter 23 so yeah we would have tried to fit it in last week but it did not line up well so here we are trying to organize the shit show the best we can right (laughs) i feel like that's our life (laughs) right (laughs) we're going to go through all of the book stuff first then get to the good stuff and talk about the movie scenes Uh (laughs) uh-huh the good stuff Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> the book chapter starts out in the Gryffindor common room, which is quieter on Boxing Day since everyone sleeps in, understandably. Sure. As you do. <laughs> Hermione's hair is back to its normal bushiness, and she tells Harry that she had used Sleek Easy's hair potion for the ball, but it's way too much to bother with every day. And I love that little touch because Harry's grandfather actually invented it. Mm-hmm. It's super fun. I need me some sleek easies, I'll tell you that. Sometimes I do, too. So Ron and Hermione seem to have mutually decided not to discuss their argument. They're like, let's just pretend it didn't happen. Right. But they're being oddly formal with one another. Like, how are you today? Mm Mm-hmm. I am doing very well. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Did you sleep all right? (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you so much for asking. How about yourself? (laughs) (laughs) Oddly formal. Ron and Harry tell Hermione all about the conversation they'd overheard between Hagrid and Madame Maxime, but she's not even a little bit surprised because Hermione knows everything. She's like, oh yeah, clearly he was half giant. (laughs) Well, duh. I knew he wasn't going to be full giant because they're like 20 feet tall, but I read about it in books and he was too big to just be a normal wizard. So obviously half giant. Obviously. Who wouldn't have known that? Something that she wasn't actually able to understand couldn't read about this in a book i would imagine is the all of the prejudice and bigotry against giants Mm -hmm. she thinks it's very similar to with werewolves and that they can't all be bad yeah i mean that's not exactly something that you would find in a book anyway especially the way the books are yeah you know what i mean and i think it's a really good point there probably is a lot of similarities between the perception of giants versus the perception of werewolves however werewolves are only werewolves part-time and giants are giants all the time so i don't know that it's completely comparable yeah werewolves are at least partially human right whereas giants are entirely different not to say that hermione's wrong i'm sure there are some lovely giants i mean hagrid's mother alone she may not have been cut out for motherhood but she was willing to do it with a human (laughs) and i gotta say there's the potter pondering i want to know how that worked i don't (laughs) fair enough funny you should mention that i have no desire to have you seen the meme (laughs) where it's i think it's olive her wood on a broom Mm -hmm. in front of the quidditch goal i'm so afraid of where this is going all of her wood is labeled as hagrid's dad and the quidditch goal (laughs) is labeled as hagrid's mom oh my god Yeah. Oh, good Lord. You're welcome for that image. I feel like the best descriptor I could come up with would be it was like throwing a hot dog down a hallway. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Because that's just, I mean, obviously they don't, you know, 
both parties don't need to feel it for it to work, obviously. It's true. Maybe but, he just climbed up in there. Right. Who knows? Oof. Maybe. Okay. You know what? Let's <laughs> Can just we not? keep rolling. <laughs> I told you. I told you I didn't want to talk about this. So anyway, <laughs> Hermione thinks that it's similar to werewolves and a lot of prejudice and bigotry. And Ron looks like he wants to comment on this. But he also is being very formal and polite and wants to avoid another argument. So he just shakes his head at Harry when Hermione's not looking. I have to say that actually shows a weird amount of maturity on Ron's part. I'm sure he learned it dealing with his mother from time to time. Possibly. But based on the way he was with Hermione at the at the Yule Ball, I feel like I'm impressed that he didn't just go for it. A little bit of growth right there. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Of course, it's not growth that we're going to see in the movie, of course. But Oh, God, no. <laughs> At least it's there in the book. Everything's there in the book. <laughs> That's why it's the book. But now everyone is starting to think about homework that they put off during the first week of the holidays. And not only does Harry have to start thinking about his homework, but he's like, ooh, February 24th seems a lot closer on this side of Christmas. <laughs> He's just like, maybe I shouldn't have been putting that up. Oh, but it was too loud. I couldn't do it. I'm just going to have to start working on it now. So he starts sitting in his dormitory and like trying to ask it questions, yelling at it over the screeching. <laughs> he throws it across the room at one point. Like maybe if it hits the wall, it'll break it and it'll shut up. But no, nothing works. I can't imagine how throwing it across the room <laughs> didn't help at all, Harry. <laughs> I feel like that would have just dented the wall more than anything. Probably. <laughs> He thinks about the hint that Cedric gave him. Which we'll actually talk about from the movie this week. Yeah. And it is set up very similarly, so we will get to that comparison. But it happened at the end of chapter 23. And he's like, it's a stupid clue. (laughs) It's really vague. I don't get it. I don't need your help. Again, very similar to the the movie. Yeah. (laughs) But he feels like... He gave him much more specific information about the dragons. Well, he did. Yeah. He literally said fucking dragons. And Cedric tells him to take a bath. And he's like, I don't need that kind of help. Especially not from somebody who keeps walking down the hallways hand in hand with Cho. How dare he? That's my hand. (laughs) I mean, it's not. It's not. (laughs) In your dreams, Harry. In your dreams. Anyway, the new term starts and Harry goes to his lessons with the usual weight of parchments and books, but also with the heavy weight of the egg in his stomach, which makes it sound like he ate it. I was just thinking that. But it was just the nerves. He was really getting desperate to figure it out. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe I can shit out the answer. (laughs) No, it was the the heavy weight in his stomach of nerves. Mm -hmm. And I have been there before. I get it. Oh, yeah. The grounds are thick with snow. And the greenhouse windows are covered in condensation and they can't even see out of them. So it sounds like a pleasant day. Sure. I feel like that would just end up weighing on you too. Mm Mm-hmm. Nobody's looking forward to care of magical creatures because it's so fucking cold outside and that's an outside class. Yeah, I wouldn't be either. No. No way. And there's scroots. There are those fucking scroots. Ron actually (laughs) jokes that the scroots might warm them up because we either have to chase them or we're going to get set on fire. Yeah, that is true. I just now I imagine one of the students getting set on fire and everybody just gathering around to warm their hands. <laughs> That's looking on the bright side right there. Yeah. But when they reach the cabin, however, there's an elderly witch waiting for them instead. Just standing on Hagrid's doorstep like, hey, sure. I'm your temporary teacher. My name's Professor Grubbly Plank. Which we've heard that name before. Yeah. So, yeah. Ron asks where Hagrid is and the old witch is just like, I'm Professor Grubbly Plank. I'll be taking over for a while. Mm -hmm. And Harry's just like, hello, where's Hagrid? Ron asked you that. You didn't answer it. You just told (laughs) us who you were. And she said that Hagrid is indisposed. Ooh. I wonder what that could mean. Yeah. Harry hears unpleasant laughter and turns to see the Slytherins looking gleeful. Of course they do. They also don't look surprised to see Professor Grubbleplank there. Mm Mm-mm. So Slytherins are up to something. (laughs) So you said that I just thought of Snape. (laughs) People will think you're up up to to something. something. (laughs) Grubbly Plank tells the students to follow her and leads them around the paddock where the Bobaton's horses are being kept to the edge of the forest. Mm -hmm. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione follow her. But the whole time they're just worried that Hagrid is alone and ill back in his cabin. 
understandably, that was a very vague statement. Yeah, she's indisposed. Like, that could mean fucking anything. Harry asks Professor Grubbly Plank what's wrong with Hagrid, and she tells him not to mind. And hot-headed Harry's just like, but I do mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mind very much what's wrong with him. Listen here, bitch. Right. And <laughs> she just ignores him. Sure. They make it to the edge of the forest and find a unicorn tethered to a tree. Aw, how magical. Okay, Lavender. <laughs> She said beautiful. She does actually whisper how beautiful it is. And many other girls give the ooh, ah, <laughs> which I'm not going to lie. I would be one of those girls if I saw a unicorn for realsies. Probably. Yeah. I might lose my mind. I might become a, like a girly pile of goo on the floor. Like, oh, it's a unicorn. It's so fluffy. I'm going to die. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Anyway. Professor Grubbly Plank tells them that unicorns prefer the touch of a woman and tells the boys to get back before inviting the girls to come closer, though they have to approach carefully. It's kind of sexist. Oh, unicorns <laughs> apparently are totally sexist. <laughs> or they're just... Wise. Smart. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> Sorry, boys. Uh, I think you should be allowed to pet a unicorn. Yeah. But... I don't make the rules. Consent is important. Just remember that. Yes. <laughs> they may be pretty, but those horns may be dangerous. Oh, yeah. Anywho. Sure. Moving on. Ron and Harry begin discussing what's going on with Hagrid as soon as Grubbly Plank is out of earshot. And they're worried that he was, like, attacked by a scroot or something, which is entirely possible. Hey, wouldn't be the first time, I'm sure. Right? Nazi von Douchebag's just like, he hasn't been attacked. <laughs> And you know he put this in his pocket specifically for this moment. Mm -hmm. But he oh, yeah. reaches in his robes, pulls out a folded up page of newsprint. Mm -hmm. Shit, I'm surprised he didn't have it in a frame. <laughs> Wouldn't have been able to fold it in his pocket then, but... <laughs> Magic. Harry takes the page. Ron, Seamus, Dean, and Neville are all looking over his shoulder. And so they're all like reading in this bundle. And I would have loved to see that. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. I just feel like that'd be amusing. <laughs> But they're reading this article that has a very shifty looking picture of Hagrid and the title, Dumbledore's Giant Mistake. Oh, she did a thing. I bet she felt super clever about that title. Oh, you know she did. The article criticizes Dumbledore as an eccentric with controversial staff appointments, citing Jinx Happy Alistair Mad-Eye Moody's position as the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher before saying that he looks kindly beside the part-human Care of Magical Creatures teacher. And I'm sorry, fuck you for calling him a part-human. That's just shitty. But anyway. This bitch right here can just eat all the dicks. Because fuck her. She honestly. might like that, though. So she, mm, Maybe. Fine. She can go spelunking in Hagrid's mother's vagina. How about that? I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of glad you did. So, hello, hello. <laughs> Anywho, uh, the article goes on to say that Hagrid admits being expelled from Hogwarts in his third year and became the gamekeeper at the school. And then goes on to say that he used his mysterious influence on the headmaster to gain his new position over many better qualified candidates. What even is this writing? Shitty. It's shitty yeah. writing. Trash journalism. Gutter journalism. Dear, right, Jackson? Dear God. Malfoy is quoted about being attacked by a hippogriff and his friend, Vincent Crabbe, for getting a bad bite from a flabberworm. What a little bitch. Oh, it gets bitchier. Mm -hmm. He says that they all hate Hagrid, but everyone is too scared to say anything. Really? Really? Nazi von Douchebag II? If you were that scared, what the fuck you doing giving a public interview? Yeah. You're obviously not that fucking scared. Hagrid should sit on you. He should turn you into a ferret and <laughs> sit on you. Maybe turn you into a sandwich. <laughs> and feed you to his mother. Z vagina. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to leave his mother's vagina out of this one. You already brought it up. It's there. I know, but I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, fuck it. He can go spelunking too. <laughs> <laughs> Blast ended scroots are also brought up in this article. Of course they are. Which is what the article was kind of supposed to be about. 
It was supposed to be about Hagrid's experience as the care of magical creatures teacher, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's what happened here. No. The article says that Hagrid bred the dangerous cross between manacores and fire crabs himself. And that the creation of new breeds of magical creatures is closely observed by the Department of Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. But Hagrid doesn't seem to think the restrictions apply to him. I mean, that's all the dicks. Trash. That's, that's absolute trash. And not just because we know Hagrid. Like, that's just shitty. It's shitty to do to anybody. That's yeah. why I don't like gutter journalism like that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The sensationalism, just looking for the reaction, is terrible. I hate it. <sighs> it gets better, though. Does it? No. Oh, fuck. The article then goes on to reveal that Hagrid's not even human, as his mother is the giantess Fred Wolfa. Uh... It talks about how bloodthirsty and brutal giants are, that many remaining giants joined with He Who Must Not Be Named, and that they were responsible for some of the worst mass muggle killings. Now, that might be true. Mm hmm However. But Hagrid has nothing to do with any of that, you horrible, horrible cow. Right. Exactly. And there's not even any evidence that Frid Wolfa was part of that. Mm hmm It goes on to speculate that she was and could have just escaped instead of being killed by Aurors. Mm-hmm. And that she may be currently living in a giant community in foreign mountains. Sure. It also says that Hagrid's antics in his Care of Magical Creatures class show that he inherited his mother's brutal nature. That just pisses me right off. I'm not okay with that. Mm. Hagrid does not have a goddamn brutal bone in his body. Unless, of course, you talk bad about Albus Dumbledore. <laughs> and he literally... Like we heard earlier. Yeah. He is the person who got him a job mm -hmm. and helped take care of him after his dad died. Yeah. Who gave him a chance on more than one occasion. Mm hmm. Hagrid is loyal to that. And he should be. Yeah. And like you mentioned last week, the closest he gets to having a brutal nature is his love of dangerous creatures. Mm hmm. But that's not. At all. Like, he doesn't love those creatures because they can harm things. He loves them because he thinks they're misunderstood. And when he looks at a three-headed dog, he sees three puppies. Yeah. When he looks at a dragon, he sees, like, a oh, baby. Yeah. Well, and you have to think, too, that's more than likely because he has felt that way himself. Misunderstood. He yeah. has felt misunderstood. He has been looked at as a half-giant, half-human. Like, this is not... Is the glass half empty or half fucking full? This is completely different. And it's a dick thing to try and lump Hagrid into something that he's not. Out of stereotypes. And misinformation. And misinformation. Mm-hmm. Ugh. I don't like it. Ugh. I don't like it. Okay, and then here's the kicker of the article. Mm. It ends mentioning Hagrid's close friendship with Harry Potter saying that it's Albus Dumbledore's duty to ensure that Harry and his fellow students are warned of the dangers of association with part giants. Motherfucker, let me at this bitch. Yeah. That's actually kind of how Harry's reaction is. Yeah. Ron is a little bit more like, how the fuck did she find out? Mm -hmm. And Harry's just like, I don't care how she fucking find out. I'm going to kill Nazi von Douchebag the second for this <laughs> we all hate Hagrid shit. Yeah. And he's just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Crab got a bad bite off of a flopper worm. They don't even fucking have teeth. <laughs> and Crab's just like, he, he, he. You know the dog from yeah. the cartoons? Muttley. Yeah, that does the Muttley. like. <laughs> that is what I imagine Crab yeah. as doing in this section. Yeah. Or the dog at the end of Duck Hunt when you fuck up. Yes. When the bird flies away. Yeah. yeah. That's Crab in this moment. Definitely. And he can go fuck himself. Oh, yeah. So there's that. He can go suck a bag of dicks. Yes, he can. Anyway, Malfoy says that he's sure this is going to end the Oaf's teaching career. Mm -hmm. Because all of the mummies and daddies will be scared that Hagrid's going to eat their children. I think he needs to be scared that I'm going to kick his ass. I'm telling you, it sounds like Malfoy needs to be turned into a ferret and then into a sandwich. I mean... It's very similar to Stoat. Yeah, probably just as gamey. Probably. Mm -hmm. As expected... Harry begins to say something back to Malfoy, but he's interrupted by Professor Grubbly playing who wants to know if they're paying attention. Like, bitch, you made him stand back. 
Right? They don't even get to stand by the unicorn. No, they're not paying attention. <laughs> what would be the point of that? But they turn back to the unicorn and they listen because she speaks up to talk about the magical properties. But Harry's just too angry. He's just like blindly looking in that direction. Just tunnel vision tuned out like. <laughs> yep. I'm going to kill Malfoy. I'm going to kill Rita Skeeter. I just... <laughs> and he doesn't hear a word she's saying anyway. So yeah. at least he looks like he's paying attention. Right. He pretends nicely. After the lesson, Parvati says that she hopes that woman stays since that's what she had expected class to be like with proper creatures and not monsters. I mean, it really depends on your definition of the word creature. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm honest. But... No, a lot of Hagrid's creatures may not have been suitable for school children. Scroots may not have been suitable. Yes. Interesting. Mm hmm And as a teacher who has had to develop a curriculum, mm -hmm. I think maybe they spent too much time on the Scroots. I agree with that, definitely. I think considering that they just started Care of Magical Creatures in third year, and this is the only their second year doing it, that maybe they need a wider variety of creatures they come in contact with. Mm -hmm. I think maybe you need to start learning about the basic ones that already exist and save the I bred these myself for seventh year. Yeah, agreed, for sure. But... He's still very knowledgeable. Oh, yeah. I think if given proper curriculum, Hagrid could have been awesome. Well, if you figure that had Malfoy fucking listened to Hagrid during the Hippogriff lesson, he wouldn't have fucking got quote unquote attacked. Right. And that lesson would have gone off without a hitch. And it would have been awesome. Everybody was really pleased with it. Everyone until fucking that loved happened. it. Everyone loved it. And then Malfoy had to go and be a bitch about it. Because he was pissed that everyone was having fun. So had that gone off perfectly, that could have led to other similar lessons. It could have set a completely different tone mm -hmm. for class on the whole. Exactly. But because all of that happened, it changed how Hagrid thought about teaching. Yeah, I would agree. So I'm going to go ahead and say this is all Malfoy's fault. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nazi bun douchebag. Her, the second. But... I can see why a girl would prefer to play with unicorns than Scroots. For sure. I don't disagree with her statement because even Hermione, which we'll get to in a minute, she feels the same way as well. Yeah. But it's a little shitty because Harry's just like, what about Hagrid? Like, that's his fucking job. Yeah. The nerve is raw. Like, hello. Currently. And Parvati's just like, he can still be gamekeeper. Not the point, bitch. Not the point. However, she's been very chilly towards Harry since the ball. I would think so, though. And he thinks that he could have paid her a bit more attention. I would think so. <laughs> Honestly. Boy, Johnny come lately there. Way to figure that out eventually, guy. Like, I don't blame her for being chilly towards Harry at all. No, he was a really shitty date. Yeah. I kind of feel like that's an instance of, like, never meet your heroes. Yeah. <laughs> like, never meet your never crushes. Never date your crush. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just have them in your head as mm -hmm. perfect because they are definitely not. And they will ruin that image. So, yeah. I'm sorry, David Tennant. We will never be able to be together. <laughs> because it will ruin my image. Anywho. <laughs> Harry does feel like he could have paid her more attention. But at the same time, she got to hang out with that Bobatons boy. And yeah. they're actually making plans to meet up in Hogsmeade the next time they go. And she's telling everybody that. So, I think it worked out okay for her in the end. Yeah. True. Although, you know. But not the point, Harry. Not the point. Again, the nerve is a little raw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's just say that. And then, like I was saying, Hermione kind of expressed the same sentiment as Parvati. Because she catches up with them when they get back to the Great Hall. And she's talking about how good the lesson was. Mm -hmm. And Harry just like, I'm not doing this again. And just shoved the article in her face, basically. Read this! And her jaw drops. Mm -hmm. She has the same reaction as Ron. How did this horrible woman find out Hagrid is half giant? Yeah. She's like, he wouldn't have told her. He mm. hasn't even told us. He's not going to blab it to a reporter. It's not something he puts on a name tag. That's for sure. No, it's not. No. And Hagrid <laughs> is not stupid. I don't care if the movie thinks he doesn't know how to spell happy birthday. He's not going to tell a reporter he's half giant. He's not stupid. Yeah. And Harry is just like, yeah, he definitely wouldn't do that. Yeah. So Hermione starts to think that maybe she somehow overheard the conversation he had with Madame Maxime. But how? But how? Ron's <laughs> like, yeah, they would have seen her in the garden. Besides that, Dumbledore banned her from the school. 
And Harry's just like, maybe she has an invisibility cloak. And she snuck the fuck in. Yeah. yeah. Hiding in the bushes, trying to overhear them. It seems like something she'd do. Like you do. <laughs> and Hermione's just like, like you and Ron were doing? Mm-hmm. But that was an accident. I mean, it was, but was it? Like, they didn't do it purposely to drop the eaves. Okay. It, they just dropped them. They just dropped the eaves and took their time picking them up. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but let's say that Harry and Ron are walking through the Rose Garden and they overhear Malfoy. Mm. Would they hide in the bushes and listen into his conversation? You bet they fucking would. Yeah, they would. You're right. They are totally also the type to hide in the bushes and spy on people. Yeah. So, yes. But not on Hagrid. Not on Hagrid. I don't think they would have. Harry, they did mention that Harry was focusing on the beetle, trying to not listen. We'll mm -hmm. come back to that. Hmm. As Quincy says, I guess this mystery is really bugging them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ron is like, we didn't have a choice. We weren't trying to hear him. He was just talking and anyone around could have. So... Maybe that's how she heard. Maybe she was hiding in the bushes and overheard it. Who knows? Don't know. We'll find out later, I guess. <laughs> we'll get there, Ron. Damn. <laughs> Stop trying to jump ahead. <laughs> Harry says they have to go see him, and the three leave the castle after dinner. When they knock on the door to Hagrid's cabin, all they can hear is Fang barking. And they shout that it's them. They bang on the door and the windows for 10 minutes. Damn. Which is commitment. That is. And then eventually they have to give up because he will not come to the door. Mm -hmm. Hermione doesn't understand why he would be avoiding them because he's got to know that they would never care about him being half giant. Mm -hmm. But Hagrid seems to care, though. Yeah. For the rest of the week, they don't see him at mealtimes, nor on the grounds tending to his gamekeeper duties. And Professor Grubbly Plank continues teaching his Care of Magical Creatures class. I feel like this is probably what Lupin would go through when people would find out he was a werewolf. Probably. I think it's a very similar thing. I think Hermione yeah. was right to compare the two. Yeah, definitely. And to top all of that off, all week they have to deal with Nazi von Douchebag II gloating about it every opportunity because he is just convinced that he has ruined this man's career now, which he's been trying to do since he became a teacher. Oh, he's been trying to do long before that. Yeah. Jesus. He's been trying to get rid of Hagrid forever. Mm-hmm. And because he's a cowardly little shit, he's a cowardly little douche ferret, <laughs> he only does this when another teacher is around so Harry can't retaliate. Of course. But this is where we're going to end the book chapter for this episode and we'll pick back up with the rest of it next week. And as mentioned before, absolutely none of that happened in the movie. So, <laughs> super fun. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> Didn't get to see a scene of it. Not a dicky bird. Not a dicky bird. <laughs> The movie scene does start out with an establishing shot of the bell tower as the bell chimes and it scares the shit out of a flock of ravens. Like, like it, it does. does. <laughs> but it sends them scattering. Understandably, really. It send me scattering. <laughs> exactly. And jumpy. <laughs> it cuts to a shot outside the castle as birds fly through the windows and the camera follows one particularly voyeuristic little bastard as it glides through the towers and lands on the windowsill outside Harry's dormitory. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's one way to transition, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Seems important. The camera view shifts to a sleeping Harry in the middle of another eye-scrunching nightmare. We then see the graveyard from the beginning of the film, possibly implying that this location is significant. Hmm. Keep that in mind. Just a little something to chew on for a bit. A bird lands on the Statue of Death before zooming into the creepy-ass skull face under the stone hood and transitioning into the hallway of the neglected and dilapidated manor. At the end of the hall is a room where Voldemort can be heard doing his impression of my sexy voice as Wormtail and the dark-haired man hover near him. I'm not going to lie, he nails it. He really does. He does an excellent Katie sexy voice. Yeah. I like to think I can do a pretty decent Voldemort voice, too, like I did earlier. You did. I was impressed. You're welcome. Voldemort whispers a request to see it again while I shout, that's what she said at the screen. She's not joking either. She shouts it every time we watch it. I do. I really do. It bores even me, but I still have to do it. That's what she said. Well done. You got me. I like that. I respect you. I spend too much time with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> The man pulls up his sleeve to show a wiggly black tattoo of the dark mark that was seen in the sky after the Quidditch World Cup. 
Voldemort declares the time to be close now, in that truly vague and confusing way, while the camera cuts back to the unsettled sleeping Harry, as Voldemort's voice says, Harry, at last, you're just in time for part cheesy. Okay, he might not have said that last part, but... It would have been funny if he had. Right? Harry would have been so confused. <laughs> exactly. Back in Dream World, Wormtail appears in the doorway and Voldy tells him to step aside so he can really give this kid a show. Ratman smirks and moves out of the way and with a flash of green light, Harry wakes up in a panic. It's really interesting that they decided to revisit this dream mm. since it's practically exactly the same as it was previously. The only difference is it was Harry walking up to the door and not Frank Bryce. Yeah, basically. And maybe the dialogue was actually a little bit different, but they didn't really let us hear it the first time around that much. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, we literally already saw this. Yeah. I don't understand the point of revisiting it in this nature at this junction of the movie when it wasn't even remotely in the book. I mean, unless to maybe remind the viewer that this is important. I guess. But did we forget that Voldemort wanted to kill Harry? I mean, I did. I thought they wanted to play Parcheesi. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> but at this point, the camera focuses on a close-up of Harry's eyes as he blinks and then cuts to Neville, who is just arriving back at their dormitory with dress robes a little disheveled and his shoes around his neck. Hmm. Which is kind of a weird way to wear your shoes. But hey... Those shits can be uncomfortable after a long evening of dancing. And who wants to carry them in your hands when you can tie the laces together and wear them like a scarf? Right. And then you can never get that knot undone in the laces. Especially not after the weight of the shoes pulls the knot tighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. He asks Harry if he's all right and then proudly informs him that he just got in. Come on, Nev. Have a little tact. We don't need you telling us about some over-the-pants action you got from Ron's sister slash Harry's future baby mama. Plus, he literally was just like, are you all right? And didn't wait for an answer. Yeah. <laughs> are you all right? I'm fantastic. <laughs> I mean, the kid had to be excited. He had a very eventful evening. Oh, he was definitely excited. You know they did stuff. I'm just saying. <laughs> in the movie. That's not how it happened in the, in the book. Well, yes, in the movie. But Harry just kind of looks at him like, no one wants a play-by-play -play of your awkward adolescent first date guy. <laughs> like, he's rendered speechless by the fear of Neville possibly being more successful with the ladies than he is. And so he really doesn't say anything out loud. Just wipes his face as Twinkletoe's long bottom twirls off to bed. Well, this scene was adorable. Mm -hmm. As I already mentioned, it goes against the book since it implies an actual romantic evening between Neville and Ginny. And that's just not how it happened in the book. It is not. He stepped on her toes all night. He did. She was a pity date. Oh, don't say it like that. I mean, pity date in the sense that she knew she wasn't going to be able to go oh, otherwise. On her part. And she was just like, I won't get to go otherwise. And you already asked Hermione and she couldn't go. And I really want to go. So yeah, I'll go. But like, it's not like she wanted to go with Neville. Yeah, but she was a stand up chick and oh, did absolutely. stick with Neville even after. Because she's a person. She's a person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you didn't want to put good person in there or... <laughs> Well, my big thing is there's no such thing as a good person or a bad person. There's people and they do good things and they do bad things. You just made it way too complicated for me. <laughs> so let's just keep rolling. Let's do. The scene transitions to the covered bridge outside the castle, where Hermione can be heard admonishing Harry for being a lying prat since he told her he'd figured out that screeching egg weeks ago and reminds him that the task is in two goddamn days. Mm-hmm. We then see Harry doing all he can to keep himself from pushing Hermione off the bridge, which I don't think anyone would have blamed him at that point, but finally decides on a nice simple sass attack where he sarcastically tells her that he had no idea since he forgot to put a reminder on his calendar, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then he quips back saying Victor has undoubtedly already figured it out, which might be a bit of a sore subject. <laughs> I don't like this scene at all. I'm not a fan of it myself, no. And it's not just because that's not how it happened in the book. Yeah. I think the conversation is strange. Mm-hmm. 
The whole point was obviously to imply that Harry was pretending like he was working on the egg when he wasn't actually doing it. Yeah. But since we never saw him say he was working on the egg, all we get is Hermione being like, why did you lie to me about working on the egg? And it's just, she's such a bitch in this movie. It Like, all they gave Hermione was telling them what to do. I mean, that's not new for the record. But it's not how she was in the book. I'm not arguing with you. She's a good friend you. and supportive in the book. And her eyebrows weren't nearly as angry in the book. And also, Harry never, ever expressed any kind of jealousy or upset that Hermione was f even friendly with Victor at all. Yeah. It was a weird thing to add in. I don't necessarily think I took it as a jibe I I kind of took it as him just being like, not jealous of Victor, but like, well, obviously Victor must have figured it out or you'd be bugging him right now instead of my ass. I just don't think he would have brought him up at all. True. I think maybe he was just getting annoyed. But Hermione shrugs and says that she wouldn't know since they don't actually talk about the tournament or anything at all, really. This is the part I really hate, by the way. She refers to him as more of a physical being, then gives an embarrassed smile as Harry smirks and explains that she just means he isn't particularly loquacious and mostly just watches her study. I hate that so much. Mm-hmm. You and me both. Ugh. But let's be honest, she's not even sure if he knows how to read at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, Doesn't know how to read. Doesn't know how to read. A physical being. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And by the way, just in case you're wondering what that rustling sound is, that would be about a million Harry Potter fans feverishly searching through their dictionaries for the word loquacious. Yes. I hate this line so much just because... He's not particularly loquacious. Loquacious. Yeah, it bothered me as well because in the book chapter, Hermione and Crumb were having a great conversation about the differences between their schools. And Hermione also later on in the books mentions that they became pen pals. Yeah. They exchanged letters. Like they write to one they... another. That's not a physical thing. Yeah. It creates more innuendo. He can't read. Yeah. He's a physical being. And it downplays their actual connection because it really dumbs Crumb down and undermines the fact that he liked Hermione because she was different from all of the other silly girls fawning over him. Mm -hmm. So I don't like it. I agree. I'm not arguing with you at all on that one. Mm -hmm. Because they made it more about, you know, how he couldn't read and less about what made Hermione special. Mm -hmm. Especially since she says that him watching her study is a bit annoying. But she refuses to get any further on the topic and brings the discussion back to the egg, causing Harry's grin to fade as she nags him again about figuring it out. He gets super defensive and turns away from her, but Hermione's eyebrows smack him around a bit as she reminds him that this tournament isn't easy. Shocker. It's challenging and cruel, and since Harry doesn't usually test very well, he could totally fucking die. So maybe get your shit together, because she's kind of scared for him. And she does nag him in the book as well. So that is par for the course. Yeah. This is more concerned friend not wanting him to be in danger. Yeah. That part doesn't bother me as much. Mm -hmm. But this scene isn't remotely how it happened in the book. No, not at all. Harry looks grim as she reminds him that he's been relying on sheer dumb luck since well before this moment. But eventually, that luck is going to run out. Mm -hmm. They're interrupted by Cedric's voice calling for Potter. Harry looks right at him and quickly retreats in the opposite direction, as if he was ever going to get away that easily. And I kind of do like that part, though, because even though, again, set up differently than the way they had the scene in the book and at a different time, it was the easiest way to show that Harry was not cool with Cedric, forgetting to take Cho to the ball when he didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Cedric has to jog to catch up to him, which, I mean, he's taller than Harry, so it doesn't take him that Wasn't much. Wasn't hard. Yeah. But he calls after him again and then asks him how he is. Harry, truthfully kind of unsure as to whether or not that is a serious question, <laughs> gives him a blank look and a sarcastic, spectacular. I love that line, though, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's some epic Harry sass. Oh, it's definitely. I love it. His deadpan responses are some of his best. They are good. Mm -hmm. Cedric, deciding to just get to the point, tells Harry that he realized he never properly thanked him for tipping him off about the dragons. 
He waggles his eyebrows kind of suggestively, but Harry tells him to forget about it because he's sure he would have done the same for him. And Cedric's like, that's kind of my point, guy. Eyebrow waggle. (laughs) Eyebrow waggle. (laughs) He then tells Harry about the prefect's bathroom on the fifth floor being a great place for a bath. Which sounds like code. Right, wink, wink. Perhaps he ought to go take his egg and mull things over in the hot water. Nudge, nudge. If you get what I'm saying. Can you read? I can't read. You want to read? No. It's weird. You made it weird. I made it weird. (laughs) I made it exceptionally weird. (laughs) With one final eyebrow waggle, he walks away, leaving behind a bewildered Harry, who is remembering how he didn't pull this cryptic shit when he told Cedric about the dragons. He legit just said, dragons. So why the hell is Cedric practically playing a round of charades to pay him back? Because it's stupid. And like you said before, this does correspond to the end of chapter 23 Mm -hmm. when Cedric stopped Harry before he heads back to his dorm to tell him about taking a bath with the egg. Yeah. As we talked about last week, it's just as cryptic. Yeah. It also gets the same information across, even if it is set up in a different way and occurs at a different point. Yeah. Six and one, half dozen the other, I guess. It worked. Yeah. It was weird timing, I (laughs) think. I would have thought they could have included it at the end of the ball scene, but I think they wanted to focus on Hermione's upset more so. Yeah. And I do have to admit, ending it on her sitting on the steps crying, taking off her shoes and being super upset was kind of a good way to end it. There was more of an emotional impact there. Yeah. Especially with the music swelling Mm -hmm. and the the whole thing was... I mm. get the choice cinematographically it was the yeah. right way to go yeah. however there's no goddamn reason why he couldn't have said it before then just done it yeah and it would have made our episodes more easy to organize so new for making our job more difficult you should have been able to have the foresight that we were going to be making this podcast nearly 20 years later right <laughs> come on damn it newell come on man but anyways moving on this is actually where we're going to end the movie section because once again, we're getting into side plots of the story that are just completely left out of the movie. Right. <laughs> so, none, none of chapter 24 happens so in the movie. Just none of it. it. Yeah. But it's a long book chapter, so we're going to get into the rest of it next week. We also don't have any new or returning actors to talk about. Nope. So we will go right into our Potter pondering, which is how do you feel about the movie revisiting the dream from the beginning of the movie? Also... If you really want to go down the nasty path, how in the hell did Hagrid's dad and mom bang? work that out? If you want to <laughs> spelunk down there, yeah, go ahead, bring it up. Yeah, let's hear it. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. And don't forget, that post will also include our phone number. And you can call it in for the possibility of ending up on an episode. We won't be picking everybody's, just a few each week. Mm-hmm. We really look forward to reading them and hearing them. (laughs) This will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from the woman who recognized us at Universal Studios, Renee Hauser. Ah, I'm so excited we get to read hers now. She writes, I identify as a Slither pup. I took the Pottermore quiz several times and was always Slytherin, Slytherin, Slytherin. Then last year, I took it again and bam, I'm a Hufflepuff. I think current events in society and my own life brought out my inner puffy. My wand is maple, nine and three quarter inches, with unicorn hair and supple flexibility. Cue Katie's dirty chuckle. (laughs) That's dirty. (laughs) I originally started reading the books when my oldest son was in kindergarten because he wanted to read them and I read them with him because I knew there were more mature themes in the story. I fell in love. I have read the books multiple times and watched the movies more times than I would admit in mixed company. My husband, who yelled your names in the queue at the Hogwarts Express, never knew anything about Harry Potter till he met me. Now he has a tattoo of the tale of the three brothers and quotes movie lines right along with me. I listen to your podcast on my walk every morning. I started at the beginning, so I listen to the older episodes every week along with the new ones. You make me laugh and think, which is a great combination. Keep it up, or should I say, just keep rolling. I love her 
so much. I know. It was so cool to meet you. I'm so glad that you asked for a picture with us and that we were able to connect with you over Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It really it made our like trip. It made our trip. It made my whole year, if I'm being honest. It made my birthday the best birthday ever. It really did. It was so awesome just because it was so organic and it was like, oh my God. And so unexpected. Yeah. It was great. It was, I loved it. It was so great. So thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us and reaching out to us and sharing that picture you took with us. Mm Mm-hmm. We're so glad you've been listening and I am so glad that you are at least part Slytherin because I love you, girl. (laughs) And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. And you can also just message it to us over social media. Yep. And now for the trivia question. In the book, what year of school was Hagrid in when his father died? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag dead chuffed. Hashtag too soon? Yeah, that too. Let's throw that one in. (laughs) Okay, two code words this week. Yeah. But anyway, they'll get a sticker. So yay. Yay. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I also just recently posted our very first video to TikTok fun so we are going to be making an effort to do more of that Mm -hmm. but time is a huge factor so we'll see how that goes but check us out on tiktok we have at least one video up (laughs) but it's a good video so there's a fun video we ate birdie bots every flavor beans and i made a little montage of us reacting to the worst flavors yep (laughs) if you want to see the whole video you can become a patron which will help us create more content and get you extra perks if you're interested, go to patreon.com slash just keep rolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of chapter 24, Rita Skeeter's scoop and the corresponding nope, because there aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just, just keep, keep rolling. rolling.